Good morning. 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 There's about five people here this morning. That's okay. Uh, we want to welcome you to our live stream here at Safe Haven. We apologize. Uh, we're a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties, and uh, we want to thank Roland's friend who's sitting in Kingston somewhere, uh, getting up and running this morning. So I don't know your name, but I just want to thank you for all your hard work and for uh, staying with us to the very end. So as I say, this is our first live stream, and uh, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Although you're in your homes, we, uh, we want you to worship with us. We want you to worship, we want you to pray, and we want you to listen to God's Word. Uh, we are experiencing unprecedented times, and we a month ago, we would not have dreamt that this would happen. But here we are, and uh, God is still with us. God is here to strengthen us and encourage us. So we want to encourage you this morning. We want you to focus on the Lord Jesus. Take your eyes and your thoughts all off the, the virus and all the problems that you've had uh, with uh, the, many, the many problems you've had this week with having to stay home and not going to different places that you normally go to. A lot of people are even, uh, they're separated from their families at this time. So uh, we want to encourage you. We want to uh, worship with you this morning. So here's Rebecca. She's going to do a few announcements, and then we're going to uh, sing our welcome song, our worship song this morning. Okay, um, we're going to sing our first song this morning, and uh, 
if you're at home and uh, you want to participate, uh, only if you feel like it. If you'd rather sit and drink your coffee, that's fine. But if you want to rise, we're going to sing, Come, now is the time to worship. Kratz is going to speak to you this morning and just uh, try to encourage you this morning. Here he is. We are actually here this morning to worship, and we pray that this may not seem to be a spectator situation, but we actually want you to pray with us, to get through the Word with us, to sing with us. God has a purpose, and It may seem very strange because you may be looking at a computer screen, you may be looking at uh, your TV streaming this, but please, don't be just a spectator, but be involved with us. And our call to worship this morning, we're going to look at from Psalm 34. And so if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to it. If you don't have one and you have a smartphone, you can go to esv.org and just follow along with the text because this is where... Worship is all about. We're with our God, and He is with us. And although we might be physically separated for a time, we're engaged with a very important purpose. You see, safe haven has not closed. We're just ministering to each other in a different format, and our God is with us. Let's look from His Word and what He is calling us to do this morning from Psalm 34, the first four verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Even through a difficult time here, the psalmist is calling the worshipers together to give thanks And mostly to give thanks that we can come to know God and to celebrate together this morning with God. This is what it means to have the praise of the people. 
And ideally, we are longing and praying for the day that we can all gather together again corporately. And we pray that this is for a season, for a brief season. But this is not the end to worship. You see, the psalmist here is calling us to bless the Lord. He has blessed us. We can come to know our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're calling right now to be a blessing to each other in a much different way. Perhaps we might have come to one physical building to bless each other, but our role of blessing is not ending even with this. And although this may strange, may seem strange for us, and as the psalmist says here, that we might be fearful, but God is calling us now to reach out to Him to put our fears before Him, to call to Him in prayer, to see the truth and the strength in His Word, and to sing out that He's with us. He's not abandoned us. He's sovereign. He will guide us. He will strengthen us. And He's called us to bless one another with the comfort of these words. Would you pray with me? Our God in heaven, You have not left us orphans. You have not abandoned us. And although there are many right now who are fearful, who are feeling alone, who who, uh, wonder what is going on. Perhaps now more than any other time, you have called us to trust in you, to put our hope in you and you alone. When everything else seems to be failing around us, you are not failing. You are the sovereign God on the throne, and you will accomplish your holy ends. Let us put our trust in you our faith in You. Let us call out to You, our God and Deliverer, that You are with us. Your Spirit is in us. Your Spirit will comfort us and strengthen us and help us to realize that You are our God, to whom we call out tonight in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, worship this morning and sing, I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you.
changes and his love for us endures forever. for singing with us. We're going to sing a little bit more. Uh, uh, Pastor is going to address you right at this moment, so thank you. We began the year talking about the principles of biblical stewardship, and this is a time actually where we're seeking to put this into practice, because it is the attention that we've sought to look to the needs of others, to be able to minister and to share with what we have that in a time like this, it makes all the difference in the world. We've been looking at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and we're almost finished that segment, and we're going to look not only at what we followed on last week with the, the proverb of uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, but now 
the word itself from 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And it reads like this. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is in explaining what biblical stewardship is about, that each person has a different circumstance, a different set of needs, a different provision that they have, and they need to prayerfully determine in their own heart, seeing how they can minister to others, and have to decide in your own heart with that. Let me look at a parallel passage. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 15. By no means is this appeal for biblical stewardship one of compulsion, because we are seeking to be faithful for what God has blessed us with. And the the word here talks about not giving reluctantly. First, not only uh, for the benefit that we would necessarily receive, but also in terms of stingy application to that giving. Glad giving from Deuteronomy 15 reflects like this, starting at verse 7. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cried to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake." For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. This is that opportunity now for those who have put storehouse givings aside, resources, whether it is food or blankets or other types of needs. We are to have our eyes open to our neighbors, but not in some type of grungy, kind of stingy type of relationship, but how the Word says here that God loves a cheerful giver. And it's funny that that word would be used because the cheerful is not a joke, it's serious business, but it's a delight to give to the needs of others. You see, God really doesn't need our money. Psalm 50, 10 and 12 says He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and it belongs to Him. And if He needed anything, He wouldn't tell you. But everything He has given us, He is giving to bless others in that cheerful giving. And you might wonder, okay, yes, we're talking about providing for the needs of our our neighbors and, and those that might be in need. What about the ministry that we're seeking to do through Safe Haven? If you have noticed on our website, right at the top, there is a button that says contribute to the needs of Safe Haven, and it says to give. You can use that on your smartphone, and we actually want to continue that purpose through worship. Yes, you can mail in a check, you can drop a check off, you can set up an electronic giving, but we have tried in this time where we physically can't be here to encourage the ministry. There are still missionaries on the foreign field that still need our support now. There are still ministries of those we are trying to seek needs and our staff to continue to meet the needs of people. So right now, we actually would encourage you as a portion of offering that you would give now unto the Lord to continue His ministry now at this vital time. Let's pray. Father, although in many ways everything seems to be in flux and undecided, we know that you have put your saints here on this planet right now for a reason. We, as everyone else is fleeing in fear, are to be your hands of comfort, that voice that can reassure others, to provide even for the, the physical needs. But Lord, lest we think that our job stops at providing to just those physical needs, we are here to minister to the emotional and spiritual needs as well. Because we need to rely on You. We need to comfort each other with the words of comfort that You are with us. 
And let us be your voices and your hands as we seek to minister to those in need now. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship this morning. If, if you're at home and you want to rise, uh, rise and join us and sing 10,000 Reasons. song this morning it's a, a song of encouragement and uh, I was reading in Isaiah 41 verse 10 it says do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand so God is here he's with us He's going to guard us and protect us, and we are going to be blessed by him. So let's be strong in the Lord, and let's sing, Because He Lives. God sent His Son. They called 
him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He bled and died To buy my pardon An empty grave is there to prove My Savior lives for singing this morning. While Roy is taking a moment to just uh, get everything set up, we'll uh, invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 46 in the Word of God this morning. We're going to look at what has been historically quite a significant passage in times of trouble that has been a a comfort to a lot of people, and we pray that it would be a comfort to you, that you would know the, the truth of God and that His Spirit would minister to you to knowing the hope of God this morning. Let's follow along, Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11, the inspired superscription before verse 1. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Almoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, 
Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, you are with us. Your word has something to teach us this morning. I pray that our spirit, not only your spirit in us, would not only give understanding, but comfort and guidance and hope that you are the sovereign God. You accomplish your holy ends. Let us seek you this morning. Let us be guided and comforted from your truth. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The difficulties that we are experiencing now are not new to this planet. Really, looking over the period of history, we've said difficulty from time to time in wars and famines and even now what biblically would be described as a time of pestilence. And there are times where these things are allowed to stop us in our tracks. And for most of our lives on this planet right now, everything indeed has stopped. And the challenge at a time when we're stopped is to look to God in His Word, in prayer, and figure out what He is trying to say to us through this. You see, biblically, there are lots of times where God will even use earthquakes, a tsunami, a war, a terrorist attack, or even a disruption to our lives, like this current COVID-19 virus, to challenge us in our busy lives about who He is and what He is doing. You see, faith in God's protection expressed so profoundly here in this psalm reaches forward to time. Because, yes, it acknowledges the difficulties we have now, but it looks forward to a time where it will point to where God will resolve all of these issues. He'll bring the chaos to an end, and He'll bring peace. Psalm 46 is a very particular, powerful song to the living God in a time of difficulty. It was Martin Luther's favorite psalm in which he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And at the time when this was going on, he was facing not only a great series of pestilence, but opposition, what must seem from all sides, from what would be the authorities of the state, the authorities of the church. And he felt pressure, so so difficult pressure that he didn't think he could bear, that he was reaching that breaking point. And he would say to his friend, Philip Melanchthon, let us come and sing the 46th Psalm together as words of comfort to our soul, to be still and know that He is God. So it is a psalm of comfort, but also a psalm of strength to those who put their trust in God. But it's also a challenge for those who have no time for God. The historical situation of this psalm is in question. Some have speculated it might have been God's miraculous deliverance of Jerusalem from the armies of King Shenaribib of Assyria during the reign of Hezekiah in 701 B.C., recorded in 2 Kings 18. Regardless, it is, a, it is a word to us speaking, and from the inspired superscription, that which is above the first verse, the headings, we see it addressed to the choir master or the chief musician. And And one of the reasons, for example, why we mentioned to sing with us this morning is that there is a purpose. The Psalms were were instructive to be sung, where you take the, the anxieties that you have 
And in singing that out, there is reassurance to our minds and our hearts that God is in control. It's directed here from the the sons of Korah, and it's a song mentioned upon or according to Almoth. Literally, that means virgins, and it may, uh, commentators say, both in a musical notation and perhaps talking to a historical event. Some look to the celebrations of 1 Chronicles 15.20 of the Ark of the Covenant among God's people, symbolizing God's presence with them. And so this, this Almoth might be a song specifically written for some of the, the higher pitch voices of a celebration that God was with His people. Although it doesn't fall into any of the recognized psalm categories of either pure praise or pure thanksgiving or pure prayer, it really deals with all the elements of our lives as a song of Zion. And it links with Psalm 2 and Psalm 24, and it's clearly divided here into three sections. And all three are dealing with different types of upheavals in people's lives, of different circumstances where the saints of God are going to go to His Word for safety. And the psalmist of Psalm 46 calls on God's people to do three things. First, confessing God's protection in verses 1 through 3. Second, experiencing God's presence in verse 4 through 7. And third, acknowledging God's power, verses 8 through 11. So now, this morning, we can know right now that a mighty fortress is our God in these times of trouble, first in confessing God's protection through the first three verses. God's people here are to flee to God as a refuge, and this is, can be associated with a word meaning to trust. He is the, the point of safety in the midst of danger. And so we flee unto God in catastrophes. And he's described here as our true refuge or security. Him in himself. There is no true security in anything else. If anything that our time should tell us is that everything that we might have relied upon that we'd always be in good health, that we would always have the resources present, that everything would just continue like every other day, we realize that all that seems to be up in air right now, and we need to flee to God as our only source of refuge and strength. So this refuge would be one of a, a defensive or external aspect of salvation, God being the unchanging one in whom we find shelter. But He also provides something else, as our text says. He provides strength or power. It's closely associated with that protection. So the strength is that dynamic aspect, that God within to empower the weak for action, and that they may find refuge and strength, because God is this one here, as our text says, a very present help in trouble. This very present is referring literally to one who could be found in difficulty, and him being enough for this situation. God is enough to deal with this situation. But let's turn, if you would please, to Psalm 22 that deals with how exactly that is the case. You see, it's it's one thing to confess God and talk about His attributes where everything seems to be fine. But it's quite another thing where everything seems to be an upheaval where you have to rely upon God. And it's the trust and understanding who God is and what He is going to do in trouble, that is the source of that strength. You see, from our text, in verse 2 of Psalm 46, it says, We will not fear. And everything in in our regular lives, the earth's stability has been removed. And it's a metaphor of disturbances, of everything. The, the common ground that we walked on is suddenly now in turbulence. Yes, there is even actual earthquakes happening at this time, but metaphorically, our whole lives are shaken in this difficulty. Psalm 22 speaks of God's presence in trials. Follow along, starting at verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. 
Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him and stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. For He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden His face from Him, but has heard when He cried to Him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear Him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. You see, as the people of God were assembled, and were assembled in a much different way this morning, as verse 22 and verse 25 allude to, that this This worship is extended to the whole world, as verse 27 says. Short of perhaps a world war, it's difficult to think of another circumstances in our lives where the entire planet has been affected. But it is the same God who is in India as is here. It's the same God that is Europe as in here and every other place in the world. And we are calling with one voice, of all the peoples of the earth unto the only source of our hope right now, that He knows our plight. He hasn't forsaken His children. He hasn't forsaken you. He desires that you would call out to Him at this time to seek His face, to seek His comfort and His strength, to know that He is God and He is still sovereign. Back in Psalm 46 and verse 3, we see another Reference of things raging in reference to the sea. Not only can we see in lesser ways like erosions, whether it's in the shores of Pickering or whether it's over the the great coasts of our nation, but the sea was something much different for the Israelites because they were very fearful of what could happen so suddenly. And isn't this much like what has come upon us? We thought there was a wave somewhere else, but now this wave has hit us. And we're seeking to flatten that curve in that same type of imagery here, that God would bring the calming to what seems to be a great wave that's coming towards us. God is our help in these calamities. We do not need to panic. We do not need to fear, but we need to flee to God as our refuge and strength. It's easy to read these words and think of Elizabeth Elliot for In her life, this passage was of particular comfort in the difficult things she experienced. She had sought to serve the Lord and had lost two husbands. The first, Jim Elliot, was killed by the Aka Indians in Ecuador while trying to reach them with the gospel. Her second husband, Addison Leach, was slowly consumed by cancer. And in relating what these experiences were like as she referred to this psalm, of the shock of death, she wrote these words, and I quote, Everything that has seemed most dependable has given way. Mountains are failing. Earth is reeling. In such a time, it is profound comfort to know that although all things seem to be shaken, one thing is not. God is not shaken, she said, unquote. See, this is what She's doing here as the psalmist calls us to do, to call upon God, to be still and know that He is God. He is still God. God is God whether we recognize it or not. And it comforts us and infuses us with strength, knowing that as our spirit falters, He can be our rock, and He is that rock. Seek Him. Now, secondly... God's people can know that a mighty fortress is our God in times of trouble by experiencing His presence. Verse 4 through 7 of Psalm 46. 
So from these fearful, destructive waters, we are suddenly introduced to a river whose streams or channels make glad or gladden God's people. It is referencing as those who are parched and need something life necessity here, that they would find something that not only meets their needs, but something that would be pleasant. And isn't this something we need at a difficult time right now? And this would have been significant for the original audience because Jerusalem did not have a pleasant river going through its center, and they tried and often had uh, water shortages that they needed to alleviate. And so, for example, Hezekiah from Second Chronicles 32 con- constructed a small channel to take water from the Gidon Spring to the Pool of Siloam inside the city, that this would be their, the source of life that would be coming into that city. And just like in Eden in Genesis 2.10, There was the the river flowing through that, symbolizing the presence of life for the people of God. And we have now, as Psalm 1 would say, the river of life which is the Word of God. And its final culmination from Revelation 22, 1, where John would see a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. In all of this, this life-sustaining picture symbolized here with the river would represent that God is the source of that life. Life proceeds from God. God sustains life and He is the only true source of life. It's a picture that takes us through the Bible to the garden of the new creation with this river of water of life flowing from God's throne. And secondly, we see here that it's an eternal city, a temple which is spoken of here as the city of God. It's where God was trying to dwell with His people. They'll think, for example, there wasn't at the time that David would would have this psalm, there wasn't a, a permanent temple that would be built. It was the ark of the tabernacle in Exodus 40 that would reside among God's people. It was erected in Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 6 later replaced by the temple of Solomon in 1 Kings 8. And Jeremiah prophesied a time that this kind of temple would be no longer, Jeremiah 3, because God would be the source of that temple among His people Himself. As our text says, a holy habitation, temple, or dwelling place, this is what the word tabernacle means among His people. Or as Ezekiel 48 says, prophesies a city called the Lord is here. It is always the source of God's presence that is the life and the, the sustaining for His people. Let's turn, please, to Second Chronicles chapter 7. There are some, as Jeremiah would warn, that somehow you can only access God's presence in a physical building. And it's often that misunderstanding that leaves people with the false impression that He's not the sovereign God of every place, but can only be accessible in a particular place. If nothing else, that Second Chronicles 7 would speak to us, it would be the message that if you have a life surrendered unto Christ, you've repented of your sins and trusted in God, that the Holy Spirit resides in you, He tabernacles, or He is God's presence in you. And although you may not be able to be physically here this morning in this building, God is with you. Notice the words here from 2 Chronicles 7, starting at verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, 
and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel, but if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you, and this house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among the peoples." And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold of other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore He has brought all this disaster upon them. And you might wonder why... There is this experiencing now a pestilence of sickness. And think how, even from our nation, the name of God, even in stretch, put into the stones of the parliament building itself, the preamble to our constitution that we'll, we will be this, this nation that would recognize who God is, that is, source of our lawgiver. And you wonder. And this is what the psalmist is trying to get at is what we're looking here at 2 Chronicles 7. What happens when a people forget from where they came and what the source of their blessing was and disregard His Word? Think of what's going on now or what specifically is not going on now. God continues to bring children into the world. And what is the greatest source of death on this planet? It's not war. It's not pestilence. It's abortion. It's the willful killing of the people that He brought. Right now, those surgeries are not continuing. He's made people male and female in His own image with a role and a purpose. Yet, people disregard that calling and that instruction from Him, and through a transgender revolution have disregarded that truth, and those surgeries suddenly now are stopped. He has said that a man should leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and they shall remain, yet we disregard it and make divorce so easy. And even the courts have stopped. And He has said for us to regard His holy law, that His name might be regarded as holy, yet it is in the commonplace used as a byword and a cuss word. Those common associations are, are halted. In everything that He has told us to do, whether it is the feeding of the poor, whether it is not murdering, whether it is not stealing, whether it is caring for other people, He has stopped all those other things, but it might be focused on something else. He has even called His people to be His instruments to proclaim His name, whether it was through fear or apathy or just being busy and all these other things, it didn't happen. Well, now nothing else can happen. And from God's standpoint, He had a purpose that wasn't being fulfilled, and He shut everything else down, that we may see What is God's purpose in this? This this whole event where our whole lives have been stopped would be a waste if we didn't seriously look, what does God want for us as a nation, as families and as individuals? What is the work that we should be doing? And now, to be still and know that He is God, we are forced to be still, to consider this fact. There is a purpose going on here. May our eyes be open to what that purpose is and realize the seriousness not only of this situation, but what God has called us to do. And why is this serious? Back to Psalm 46, 4. Because He is the one who is most high. 
He is over our families. He is over what we think is the sovereignty of our lives and even our nations and the international committee. Oh, no, no, no. He is the God that is most high. He is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who has power over the nations. You think you can control this and you think you can control that? It is God that is truly in control. He is the sovereign God because He is in the midst of His people, verse 5. The city of God remains. His purpose still remains. It's not moved or toppled. And there is hope because He is sovereign, as our text continues in verse 5 of Psalm 46. When morning dawns or at the turning of the morning or at the daybreak, there is going to be relief. It is that, that light that is to come when everything right now seems so dark. He is the source of that light for His people when there is darkness all around. And to emphasize His security with His people in verse 6, He's showing this, this parallel between the peaceful and unmoved, verses 4 and 5, and many commentators think that this reference here in verse 6 in Psalm 46 might be referring to the conquering that the Assyrian armies had over King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. And that's why he's giving this description, as our text says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. And they would mock the people of God, the Assyrians. Yet in Isaiah 37, it was God that destroyed that army, that it was then the Assyrians that became this byword against His people. That's why, as our text says in Psalm 46, 6, He utters His voice and the earth melts. Some of us speculated what is going to happen even as temperatures begin to warm up, how it's going to affect this virus whether it is the sun that is going to melt away this virus. It may or may not. I am not a scientist, and I do, don't give scientific information of, this inform of, of what is going on with the virus, but I, what I can tell you is that all it takes is the voice of God, the Son of God, to utter His voice, and this virus, it will melt. And this is what we are praying for with God, that He would take action. Yes, we are to obey legitimate commands that the government has for us. Yes, we are to make common sense approaches in how to deal with this. But ultimately, this is a time where we need to be praying like we ever have before. That we would pray that God would, His voice, and all it takes is a single word. It took a single word for Christ to say, Arise, and people rose from the dead. It took a single word to say, still, and the waters were calm. And it takes a single word for God, and all of this can end. Perhaps at this time, he's seeing how serious and where we put our trust. Are we putting our trust in our bank accounts, in our stockpiles of food, in all our preparations, in our hand sanitizers, in our government? Or are we putting our trust in God? Are we seeking right now for the voice of God? For a single word for God can calm and melt this virus itself. Notice the refrain in verse 7, reminding us of this opening confession. Even in the first verse, the statement concerning God's presence in the city, like in verses 4 through 5, he's described here as the Lord of hosts. This is the first reference here to his covenant name, Jehovah, Yahweh. The, the addition of the host here underlines the fact that God is the all-powerful ruler of the universe. That's why he's giving an example here. He's the God of Jacob. When how would you describe how God, who he is and how he operates? It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And why were those types of references mentioned? Because you would think back, what, what did he do through Abraham? What did he do through Isaac? What did he do through Jacob? This is that same God here. We don't look at these as fairy tales of just get your act together and we can just think positive thoughts. No, this is a very real God that can operate right now. And the same miraculous works that you saw through our forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can see right now if you would put your trust in this God. This is the God who is with us. This is why Christ came. He is not a far-off, distant God that does not hear our prayers, that is unconcerned. 
He knows that we could not give a sacrifice that would be sufficient to get us out of our situation. And ultimately, it's not through the work of governments or through us that is going to solve this problem. But he knew our problem. He knows our problem. And what did he do? He sent Emmanuel, which is God with us. This is the whole purpose of why Christ came. Yes, there will be healing from sicknesses and disease and hunger and pestilence. But the ultimate redemption is because of God with us, of Jesus Christ. It's the whole purpose of why He came. In the 14th century, the Black Death, otherwise known as the bubonic plague, a disease that spread throughout what was discovered to be rodents and fleas where they lived in great numbers and in density and proximity to humans, resulted in the death of 50 million people in the 14th century, which worked out to 60% of the population of Europe. Currently, the lethality rate, people are speculating for COVID-19, is about 3.4%. Could you imagine living at a time where 60% of the population, or 50 million people, perished because of plague? You see, it was... During that time, in 1527 in Germany, that people began to panic. And Martin Luther and his wife, uh, Katharina, decided to actually open up their home to provide medical care. And what is so fascinating, in times of difficulty, it has actually been the Christians when the medical systems either didn't exist or get overrun and overcapacity, that Christians stepped in to help those in times of need. And even when it threatened his own family, Luther and Katharina took people in to their home with a makeshift hospital. They took in the sick and cared for them. They were demonstrating what actually is Christian hospitality, even at the risk of their own lives in the process. The constant companion of uncertainty, death, persecution, and pain actually multiplied among the the German Protestants that sought to be faithful to God between the years of 1527 to 1529. And it was during that time that the reformer Martin Luther wrote, a mighty fortress is our God. And you see, it became an anthem in the midst of pestilence and sickness. That God knows our condition, that He has a work for us to do, and we will trust Him regardless of how dire the circumstances are. And it's the reality of the presence of God to give God's people comfort, but knows that He is that protection in the storm. Now, finally, God's people can know that a mighty fortress is our God in times of trouble by acknowledging His power, verses 8 through 11 of Psalm 46. So this Call finally goes out now to come and to look at the deeds of Israel's covenant God. Who is that God? He is the Lord. He is the sovereign one. There is a reason why even Jesus was given that title, because He is in control. He knows what is going on here. And although God's people may waver, God never wavers. To behold the works of the Lord. Now just think how even that is a prefiguring to Calvary. What seems to be the greatest tragedy and injustice in the death of Christ, behold the works of the Lord. He brings about the redemption of His people. This is a unique opportunity in history. We may never find another opportunity like this in our lifetimes. And it's the difference between those who would profess the name of Christ and cowering in fear and saying, no Lord, I will trust you now. Your word isn't a fairy tale. It is truth. And I have work to do. I have work to pray. I have a song to sing. I have a word of comfort for my neighbor. I can provide them with food and, and shelter and whatever their needs be. And as everything might even shut down, and we pray that that may not be the case, but our Lord does not cease. And the ministry for His saints does not cease. And even when you would behold the works of the Lord, our, the psalmist says in verse 8, He has brought desolations on the earth. And you think 
from Psalm 73, the enemy, in this case the Egyptians of the Red Sea. And the people of Israel would call out so many times, how could you use the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, how could you use these people to, to, to have this desolation upon your people itself? And he has often allowed those circumstances when a people have forgotten where their true source of comfort is, where their true source of assurance is, and forgot their main purpose, to glorify God with their words and their deeds, to proclaim His truth. And whether it was taking them actually out of their city and putting them in captivity in Babylon, that they may realize that there is still a work to do. Even though it may not be in this physical location, there is still a work to do in a time that might seem to be an exile. Our God is our God. And when did the people of God shine? When did Daniel shine? He shone when he was in captivity, when he was being directed, when his movements were restricted. Then he showed what it means to continue to trust God and to be faithful. This is the work that God has for us. Notice in verse 9, the, the end to that destruction, how God breaks the bow and shatters the spear, how He burns the chariots or the wagons with fire, similarly to Psalm 76. How does God ultimately do this? Please turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You see, things most likely will be very different this year for Resurrection Sunday. Most times, out of perhaps besides Christmas, it's when the time where most of the saints of God gather together to celebrate this victory. And although we may be legally restricted from doing that, this victory has not ceased. And that celebration can not, doesn't necessarily have to cease. And it's actually through difficulty where the victory in and through Jesus Christ is most needed to be celebrated. He is our Prince of Peace to our heart that is in turmoil. Follow from 1 Corinthians 15, this wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at His coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection... It is plain that He is accepted who put all things in subjection under Him. When all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him 